Okay, so welcome off to what's going to be the last track. So I get the graveyard slot. Hopefully you're all a bit more awake than I am because I'm desperately jet lagged and full of coffee. So let's hopefully I can keep it together. So what I want to talk about today is about performance. And the most important thing about performance is you come at it from a scientific perspective. And this guy sums up so much for me for how we should be thinking about things. Like he famously was involved with many different things, but particularly the space shuttle and the whole thing of defining the problem being the O-ring and explaining that. He was part of what was known as the Rogers Commission. And these were two interesting facts about Feynman involved in this stated by Rogers. So Rogers headed the commission and it started off by saying Feynman is becoming a real pain. He kept sticking his nose into everything, he kept asking questions, he kept challenging everything. By the end of it, Rogers had a different view of him. He described him as someone who's got the greatest scientific integrity of anyone he ever met. And a lot of what that's about is how he looks at problems, is it must be an experiment that can be proven. And he's got a lot of nice sort of things about it. So let's wind back a little bit about Feynman. And he got a Nobel Prize, he got it for his work on QED, and whenever he proposed it originally, there's like three proposals around the same time, all with slightly different means. No one realized they were the same thing for a while. Most people didn't even understand what they were about, and Freeman Dyson worked it out, and he actually helped them explain what it was. But I love his description of it, like the quantum electrodynamics. It's so, in, so interesting because it explains everything that you kind of want to know in this space, but the bit I really like is it's the most accurate theory ever tested by experiments on Earth. And this kind of sums up how we should think about performance. We want to have experiments to prove it. So let's take a point from the man himself, is it does not matter how intelligent you are, if you have a guess, and that guess cannot be backed up by experimental evidence, then it's just a guess. And it's kind of nice that some people are starting to do this. Like Ben gave a great talk yesterday where he explained how they went through and worked out what they should be doing with event loops. But they did it based upon experimental evidence. And this is really important. If you want to get performance right, you've got to think this way. So what I want to do is talk about how we design for performance. And I'm going to cover four topics. So I want to cover what is performance to sort of set some ground for it. I'm going to talk about how we sort of do things in a clean and representative manner, which is very key to this. We'll talk about implementing models and how we actually do performance testing itself. So kind of what is performance? It's a very nebulous concept. We talk about we want a system to be fast, we want it to be performant, but it, that doesn't really mean anything. What we really start caring about is a number of things. One is throughput. And that's like how many units of something over a given time period can we get through? We'll also hear the term bandwidth, where bandwidth tends to be maximum throughput for something that you're doing. We also will talk about latency, and we'll talk about response time. These are two different things. And again, in our industry, we keep mixing these up. And we get it all quite confused. But it's like, how quickly does something respond, or how long are we waiting, if we want to think about it? Can I also just want to make a quick point on scalability, which is something else. So by scalability, what we mean is if we add more resource, we should get a proportional increase in throughput. That is a scalable system. If you're just adding more resource and you do not get a proportional increase in throughput, you do not have a very scalable system. You've got a problem somewhere. And ants are a great example of this. To have great scalability does not mean you have great performance in either the throughput or the latency sense per unit. And the great example of this is ants are actually very dumb. So most of the ants have the job of going out, finding a leaf, taking a piece of the leaf, and bringing it back. Now, whenever ants go pick up leaves, they grab with one of their little hands a bit of the leaf, and with the other one, they cut. 50% of the time, they grab the wrong side, and the leaf falls on the ground. So they're not really striving for efficiency. But what's really neat about that, and this is where evolution has done something very clever, that is not the dominant cost. The dominant cost is taking that thing back to the mother load where it's all going to back. So where we need to bring it all back to that trip back is the more important part. And we do this a lot in technology is we focus on these little things and miss the big important thing, and that's the gap back. So you don't need to be intelligent. You just need to do it right. Now, when it comes to performance, I think this sums up nearly the entire picture for me. This is my life a lot. 
I end up flying and I end up going to border control. And with this, you can explain everything that's actually relevant about performance. So we hear about latency, we hear about response time, different things like that. So what is the difference between these? We just interchange them, but there is actually a distinct difference if you look at queuing theory. So if I join one of these queues, I'm going to be doing a number of things. And each of those things, we can measure them in different times. So how long I'm waiting in the queue is my latency. That is how long I am latent to do something. When I get to the front of the queue and I go to the desk, I'm now being serviced. That is the service time of a system. Those are distinctly different. Now, what's response time? It's latency plus service time. And if you want to start modeling these things right and starting doing some real math on it, we have to break these down and understand what we're dealing with and how we deal with it. And so then what is parallelism? Well, I just have more queues to go to here. It's obviously the perfect model for this. You also talk about things like work stealing. Well, what if one of these queues is too long and another one's too short? You'll usually have someone come along and tell you to move from this queue to another queue. There are all these sorts of things. We do this in reality, but quite often it doesn't really manifest itself properly in software, yet it's really, really simple. Before I had this little chat, who thought response time and latency was the same thing? It's OK to admit, a lot of people probably do. In fact, actually, most people use latency to describe response time. Latency, look at the word, look it up in the dictionary, is about being latent. You're waiting. Response time has to include the service time as well. And once we understand these, you can actually design systems better, and you can optimize and profile and do all of the right sorts of things. So in particular, let's look at queuing theory for a second. So whenever we start using the system, the more we use it, we notice that our response time starts to slow down. Well, why does it slow down? Because actually the service time is the same, but you start joining queues. And the thing is, if you go to something and it's being used more often, so the utilization's going up, the probability of someone being in the queue is greater. So if you're only using something at like 10% of its utilization, the chances are there's no one in the queue. So you get a good response time because you're not latent. So the secret to having very responsive systems is keep the utilization down. Don't have them running at maximum utilization. And we can see here on this graph that once you go about sort of 60 to 70% utilization, things start getting pretty bad. This also works in reality for projects and people and everything like that. If you run your teams at over 60% utilization, if you need them to respond quickly to a need, guess what? They're not going to be able to. It's math. You cannot run away from it. This is just probability theory. It's 100-year-old math. And it's well described. And so if you start breaking these things down, we can get that. So if you're designing, say, a financial trading systems, you want to have it so over-provisioned that whenever some work comes along, you want to have utilization so low that you're pretty much just going to get hit with service time. If you end up having your system working quite busily at that point in time and you get a burst of traffic coming in, your utilization is quite high, you're going to queue and your response time is going to go. So you've got to be aware of these and we'll look at how we measure them and deal with them later on. So that's kind of one of the pro tips is always ensure you have sufficient capacity. And by having sufficient capacity, you will keep your utilization low and you can respond quickly. So if you want a service that's going to respond quickly, utilization needs to be kept low. So can we go parallel and speed up? That's, we looked at the, that's a single service doing a single thing. We go back to those rows. So we can have multiple rows and multiple queues going in. Well, it's great whenever those rows are all completely independent, but in reality, quite often they're not. There's usually some component of an algorithm that's sequential and shared between sort of multiple threads going. And so let's say if we look at a, a process and we can split it up into A and B, if I can break up A, I can get a speed up. So I'm running on, say, a four-core machine. I can speed it up by doing A in parallel. But let's say I can't break up B. I'm now limited in what I can do. Say it's the other way around. I can split up B, but I can't split up A. I can only get a certain speed up. This is Amdahl's law. It's been around for a long while. It's not actually, Amdahl didn't coin the law. 
he talked about Amdahl's argument, and he's trying to convince us all not to go and buy mid-range machines. He wanted to buy big mainframes that are very fast processors because he didn't want to do in parallel computing. He wanted to peddle his mainframes. Uh, but he made a good point that actually parallel programming is difficult. So here's your typical sort of speed up curves. Like if 50% can be made parallel, you can only get a 2x speed up. You will not get more than 2x speed up. Like even let's go up to 95% of your algorithm can go in parallel, you will not get more than a 20x speed up. It's math, it's the law. You will not get past this. And so you, you've got to make sure that you do not have contention in your algorithms. But it actually gets worse. That's the perfect case world that deals with contention. It doesn't deal with coherence. So when we have that contention, we have to make the results of that contention coherent to the different threads. And we get into a slightly bigger formula at this stage, universal scalability law. I recommend you look into it. But we can now model what's going on in a system based upon contention and coherence and start working out what is the response time and what is the speed ups we can get. We can start plugging this in. And if I plugged in a coherence factor of 250 microseconds and a contention factor of 5%, these are the curves I get as I throw CPUs at a problem. Now, if you sort of look at this graph, if you look over here at the sort of two, four, eight CPUs, you can see it over here, it all kind of stays in step. And that's the world that we've been in for a while for the majority of people. But we're now moving into the 16, 32, whatever core is going up. And these are sort of problems. You also see this if you sort of are running something on Amazon AWS and you're running with lots and lots of machines where actually the coherence cost gets a lot higher. You can't split up certain problems in ways. It just won't scale. And after a while, the cost of the coherence starts to dominate to the point where you start to slow down again. So going parallel is not the answer if you've got any coherence problems at all. In fact, you need a problem that's embarrassingly parallel. And by embarrassingly parallel, it means there isn't a contention point. Then you can go and scale up quite well. And it's hard to do this. So that's just something to be aware of and watch out for. It's why I'm a big fan of not ever having multiple riders to the same thing. If you've got multiple riders, you've got contention, you've got coherence as a problem. If you have a single rider, you avoid most of that, and you can actually perform and scale much better. And it's a lot easier to understand and reason about. So there's good reasons for doing that. So I also believe in that things need to be clean and representative. So we hear about clean code often, it's clean movement and stuff. I like to look at the meanings of words quite often. So like I've had a bit of a bash on latency, but let's see, look at clean. I love this description from the Oxford English Dictionary. It's like morally uncontaminated. Most code, when you look at it, is far from uncontaminated. It's actually quite disgusting. And so to have clean code, we've got to get back to the purity of what it should be doing. It's also important that it's representative. And what representative really means is that it's, it's a true portrayal of something. It's the place where we capture our understanding. I think documentation is great. It's a great way of thinking about stuff, and you should do it. But code is actually the place where you should capture your best understanding. And don't ever feel bad about it. Like, what you put in code today is your current understanding. It's imperfect. You learn more things tomorrow. You should update your code to reflect what you've learned. If you don't, you end up with the whole creep between your understanding and the place in the code. So if you're just constantly keeping this up, so it should be the place where you capture your current model and move forward. And that model is not just the model of the business, it's the model of how the system works, because then it's a true reflection and a true portrayal. And when you've got that direct mapping, you find that you get really great performance. If you have an impedance mismatch between what your model is and what's actually going on, you end up with a performance problem. And that's what I kind of call mechanical sympathy. You don't need to have a perfect understanding. You've got to know what is enough so it's representative to what's going on underneath. And that kind of takes us into abstraction. So we've abstracted what's going on underneath. And we use this term a lot. I keep hearing people say abstraction, particularly like they will create an interface or a type for something. And that type is generally used to represent a number of things that are like something, and we use it kind of generically. We tend to abstract too quickly. Well, here's my rules of abstraction. Rule number one, do not abstract. Rule number two, don't do it. 
Number three is start considering it when you've seen at least three things that are the same, not sort of, kind of, maybe, are the same thing. Then you should start doing that. Abstractions have a cost. They have a layer of indirection. They have lots of things that it imposes upon your code and on your thinking, so they've got to pay for themselves. Now, I'm saying don't do them totally. I sort of start off by joking about don't do them. I mean, don't jump into them. And actually go to the other extreme is dry is very dangerous. I keep seeing this all the time where people will start drying out code really quickly. Don't repeat yourself. They look at a problem and think, yeah, I think this is kind of the same. And they create the abstraction before they even create any of the versions of the code. Just build two, three, whatever it is, completely independent things that you need to do. Then look at them afterwards and see if there's any commonality. I keep seeing it done the other way around. The other way around is a big flaw because you've, you've committed yourself, you've created your little baby, or your, in some cases your monster, and you want to keep it alive and keep it going there. And then this stays in the code, even though you know better now, but you, because you've invested in it, you don't get rid of it. It's so much better to go the other way around, even if you have to completely copy and paste, rewrite something, make it work exactly how it needs to be, then factor out what's common. That's the best way to use abstraction on this. And then it doesn't cost anywhere isn't as much, especially to yourself and understanding and dealing with your code. Because one of the things is once you start abstracting, and let's say we're in the object-oriented world, we create a type, and then we deal with that type polymorphically. Once you've got one version of that, that's kind of great. That's megamorphic. Our runtimes can do a lot to optimize that. If you get two versions, you get bimorphic. And we can still do some things there as well. We can put branches in and just go one of two ways. Typically, once you get three or more, you go megamorphic, and we start going into things like jump tables. We'll go into linear scans of interfaces to find out which method I'm going to actually execute. People don't even realize this. You put an interface on a class, you've got multiple implementations. See if you've got multiple interfaces on a class. When you go to call that method at runtime, quite often you can end up in linear searches through interfaces because you're getting carried away with these layers of abstraction. If you need them, great, but don't put them in just for the hell of it. They've got to be worth it. And it's good sometimes if you've just got one or two types. Be careful when you start getting many types to stuff because processors are not good with branches. They're good with predictable branches, not good with branches you cannot predict. And quite often when you start doing that, it's not representative, and that's usually a big smell. I, Todd mentioned it earlier in the keynote today. We got to sort of trust our senses, trust our taste, and you know when stuff's starting to smell. We've got to start listening to that and stop doing it, so you're doing it kind of right. A classic for this is kind of big frameworks. And, hey, you say, well, is it a framework, is it a library? I've got a really simple distinction when once something's a framework, when something's a library. If it infects your code and forces you to work in a certain way, it's a framework. You shouldn't be doing that. If it's a library, you can use it. You use it in an isolated place, and it doesn't infect the rest of your code. That's good. That's composable. That's what we want. We want stuff to be, we reuse it because it's great, it helps us out, and it stays isolated. If it forces you to work in a certain way, ugh, start to worry. You can't later optimize that. You can't later change your code and work with it quite well. So watch out, and these are the things that get you there. You end up with this sort of mentality, especially when you're carried away with frameworks. And it's like the people who ever go backpacking. Seasoned backpackers sort of know how to travel light. People who sort of think, oh, yeah, I have all this stuff. This stuff is going to be great for me whenever I go. Our code bases get like that too quickly. I too often see people turn up on a project, and before they even work out what the problem they're solving, they're installing Spring, Hibernate, this, that, and the other. And it's like, what is all this crap? And it's like, why are you doing this? Oh, we need this before we start coding. Really? Start coding, then see what you need. And everything you introduce, you introduce it because it saves you time and it pays for itself. If it doesn't, do not use it. Travel light. No, because your code base is a liability. The more you have of it, the less you can react, the harder it is to optimize, the harder it is to get it all right. So keep the stuff light, you'll be going a lot faster. So the other point is abstract, but only when you're sure of the benefits. And one of the things that really stands out for me is like the fact that we have a law of leaky abstractions. Joel Spolsig's law. 
It's because we've got it wrong. We're abstracting the wrong things. And I talk about the non-trivial. In fact, abstractions should not be big. Abstractions should be small. If we look to something like mathematics, abstraction is used all the time, and it's used brilliantly, but it's small, it's composable. It's not big and imposing. That's usually a good sign of the smell. And as Dijkstra pointed this out really well, is if we use it, we're using it to be more precise. We want to deal with something as a concrete thing that we understand. So let's say, how can we abstract a memory system? So it's very complex modern memory systems, but actually, if you understand the abstractions of it, it actually works really well. So it's getting this stuff right. So memory systems are about three bets. It's that simple. Our hardware friends are working with three bets, and the first bet is a temporal bet. If I use something, I'm likely to use it again soon. So things are close in time in how they use, so they're taking that bet on the time. They also take another bet on the space. So things that are close together tend to be used together. And this is where things like cache lines, OS pages, or TLBs, all of this sort of stuff. So what you want to do is keep your stuff together that you use together. That's the way you can play to this bet. And the third bet, and this is it, only three in total, there's a striding or pattern-based bet. So if you go through code in a predictable way, you go through our data in a predictable way, it can be prefetched for you, and it hides that latency or response time you have to dealing with something. So this is what matters with the abstractions. You've got to understand what it is, what it's doing, not the level of detail. I see people getting obsessed with what size is the cache. Well, you shouldn't really care about it. You've got to care that there is a cache, and you're using it in the right sort of way, and those are the sort of things that matter. So sort of start thinking in that sort of way to, like, what is the hardware giving me? What are the sort of design principles the people who used, who built that hardware were working to? And make sure you're sort of playing well to that. And then you're doing the right sort of things. So let's move on from this now. If we're going to build models, we need to build them in the right sort of way to get our performance. And quite often, I see some fundamental issues. So coupling and cohesion is kind of classic. There's lots of other things, like separation and concerns. But these two, in particular, are a massive impact on performance. And it's quite a soft and subtle thing. So let's take a really simple example that's actually riddled with implications. So developing a queue, a really simple concurrent queue. And that queue is going to be a rare act. So we've got a buffer in it, which is an object array. So I can put references into my queue. And what I could do is I could use buffer.length as the thing to represent the capacity of the queue. From a modeling perspective, that would make me cringe to use buffer.length. So I will typically put capacity into the class itself to say what I'm doing. Well, what actually ends up happening with this subtle little change rather than just hacking it is one is I'm being more expressive. I'm being more representative about what I want. But if I want to work out the length of the queue, I've got it there with this pointer. I can get to it by dead reckoning whenever I use this. So that's the, the bet on spatial. It's probably in the same cache line. It's going to be really fast. If I go to get buffer.length, I've got to follow a reference off to another object and read the length field. That's a data dependent load, and your processor can't speculate to get there. So it starts costing you. It also gets a bit more subtle than that. So if I'm using a queue, queues are typically always full or empty. They don't tend to exist in any other states. And so if you get a burst of traffic in, guess what happens? It just fills right up. And if you wrap around a circular queue, the head and tail come right next to each other. They end up in the same cache line quite often, slowing each other down through a thing called false sharing. Now, let's say, for example, I decided to make capacity, whatever the size of buffer.length is, minus 32. I reduce the capacity of my queue. All of a sudden, I under burst scenarios, if I'm going to be filling the queue, I'm not going to be impacting the consumer taking out of the queue, slowing them down, because the producer is not causing false sharing of facts and cache coherence traffic, all because I'm just able to control it with a simple little variable. And I'm modeling what's going on. So just pulling these things out, making them important. I think a bit further than that is stop thinking of your classes as just bags of properties. They have to be a thing. And they have to have a purpose, a very clear, very precise purpose, and make it expressive. 
And once you start doing that, you get so much better behavior. I mentioned this morning in the keynote how I, I quite often go in to see different clients, and I go in to see the clients, and I get to know their code base by just starting to refactor it. And I look for all of these smells, like feature envy, bad coupling, things that should be cohesive and brought together and not together. You start pulling these things all together, and you get much cleaner code base that's much easier to understand, and you tend to get a big bump in performance because things end up being where they should be. They end up in the same cache lines. You don't go chasing pointers across other things. You play to the bets of how hardware works, how the memory subsystem works, and you get the benefits from it. So you've got to respect this locality of reference. And as our memory gets bigger and bigger, it is not getting any better on response time. So you better get the patterns right to get the right sort of behaviors. Because the gulf now between having a full cache miss and processing instructions is getting on the order for about 500 instructions. A cache miss is about the equivalent of 500 instructions with a full on cache miss on a server now. So getting this stuff right really makes a difference. What it actually screams out to me is it doesn't matter about how many instructions you're processing. You shouldn't even be thinking about that almost today. You've got to be thinking in cache misses. For any given algorithm, you can almost start counting cache misses to count how long it's going to take to do any set of operations. Mm. So when we come to cache misses quite often, we also end up thinking about relationships between our objects. These innocuous little lines when people draw things. So classically in finance, you'll deal with orders and order books and people will just draw a little line. All the gold is in that little line. So we've got to think about it. What's it doing? So forgive the little bit of UML here for a second. It's just going to pick it because it's common. Well, in fact, this relationship is actually two relationships typically. There's bids and offers, and it's a one-to-many in this sort of case. But there's more than that. It's also usually qualified on price. And it's ordered and typically FIFO. Going through the thought experiment of really reasoning about a relationship tells you so much, and you understand how things work. But really importantly, you get to now choose what is the data structure you should be using to represent that line. That is the really important thing in modeling and the thing that will stay with you your entire career no matter what happens in changing hardware and software is the data structures matter. You want a set of characteristics for that relationship, which data structure do you pick to give you those characteristics and that starts to really matter. I've interviewed people and asked really simple questions about what is the difference between a hash map and a tree map and had things thrown back at, oh, you don't need to know implementation detail these days. It's like, hang on, I'm not asking you how to implement a hash map or a tree map. It's, what's the difference? What does it give you? What are the characteristics of it? We should know these sorts of things. You should be picking up the right tool for the right job to give you those characteristics. So really, make friends with your data structures. One of the best investments you'll make in your career, and it will stay with you for your entire life. So you learn about bloom filters, you learn about maps, you learn about trees, all that sort of stuff. I guarantee you, if you're 20 years old now and you're still programming at 60 years old, that stuff will still be useful. It won't go away. It's just useful stuff that keeps, keeps us all in jobs. Interestingly as well is how do we look at this and how do we understand it? I had some really good uh, talks with people who understand the psychology around this. And like, jumping into code is great, but it only gives us one way of thinking about a problem. You should document how you're going to do something. It uses different pathways in your brain and explores the problem in an interesting way. Discuss it with other people. Discuss how you're going to design the tests. Discuss how you're going to code it. Maybe even do crazy stuff like write the code in an imperative fashion, write the tests in a functional fashion. <coughs> Doing those different ways of looking at a problem, maybe even do a formal specification, you will get something much more succinct, much more pre precise and get it there, but at least Document it and talk to people about it. And your purr is not sufficient for this. So it's a really important part of doing stuff. We, we, should, we need to be collaborating and working together and you get simple, much more refined solutions. And it kind of passes this, what I call the out loud test, and you just make a lot less mistakes with this. We also need algorithms. And we'll all have seen sort of the order of algorithms if you care about performance and stuff. What's really interesting is you've got to know what N is. And this is back to the relationships and the cardinality and the things that you're dealing with. 
but there's also constants in a lot of these algorithms. So we quite often look at, well, n's the only thing that's important. Well, quite often the constants are very important, especially for sort of small and moderate sizes of n, the constants can be very dominant. I, I quite often see a case where people go, this must be a hash map, and this must be a tree, or whatever. And we ask, well, how big is n? Well, it never really gets bigger than about 20. Why are you using the map or the tree? Just stick it in an array. And then you ask, well, do you ever have to iterate over it? Yeah, all the time. So you pick that tree or a hash map or something, and you've got something that's in the order of about 20 items, and you're iterating them all the time. Why isn't it an array? Think about these things. It really starts to matter. And then people say, oh, yeah, well, what if n gets bigger? Well, fine. Do you know whether n's going to get bigger or not? That's the question you've got to be asking and finding out. You find out that n is massive. Yes, you should be doing something else. A really interesting thing around this I like to do is not just know the order of the algorithm, actually work it out through testing and experimentation. Because quite often, people think the order of the algorithm they're going to get is not what they actually get. So you've got to do that Feynman thing. You've got to write the experiment. You've got to find out what it really gives you. And so like to importantly, focus on n, focus on c, and start measuring, really finding this stuff out. Not just n, but the cardinality of the relationships. Like, if you ever work with really good database people who know about large data sets, they're obsessed by the cardinality on lines. Yet we so often just draw boxes and don't think about it. Star. What is it? What is star? N becomes really, really important. How many orders in a market? How many customers? How many products? How many movies? Whatever it is. It's like, what are people doing for these things? How many times do they watch it? How many times do they buy it? So the thing is, but algorithms are the key to the service time. So we know that response time is service time plus the latency, time you're waiting in the queue. So getting the service time down is really important. What's really, really important about service time is service time is related to utilization. So if you half the service time, you have half the utilization of something. And so imagine you're running at 80% utilization and you half the service time, you're now down to 40% utilization. Guess what happens now to your response time? It's a much better. It's not typically just half as good, it's much better than that. If you're up at 90 or 95% utilization and you half, you can probably get a 20x improvement in response time. So it's just like knowing these things, mapping them through. Batching is so important. I think if there's one thing I do in any design is I'm looking for every opportunity I can to batch because this is where all your performance wins typically come. Because what it does is it allows you to amortize expensive costs. That going to disk, that taking a trip across to another machine, the taking the big cache miss, whatever it happens to be, you want to batch up as many things as possible when you take those big costs. We do this in reality. Like we don't get everybody going from A to B in an individual car if we can, if they're all going the same way. We put them on a bus, we put them on a plane, it's all this sort of stuff where you put many bums in seats and get them there. It should be exactly the same thinking in your code. And particularly for this, we've got to be thinking about being, syn being synchronous is going to hurt us. We need to be thinking asynchronous for everything, because as soon as you think asynchronous, batching becomes so easy everywhere. And this is like one example up here. It's like expensive resource, I want to use it. Multiple producers want to put some data into this expensive resource. If they all go to do it at the same time, first of all, I'm probably going to have to have mutual exclusion on this resource. So I'm going to have to do something, and then you're going to have to queue to take your turn to enter that critical section that's protected by your mutual exclusion. So if you're going to use something, and even if it's just three, and it's one unit of time, one thing's going to take one unit of time, one's going to take two, and one's going to take three units of time. So on average, you're going to take two units of time. And as your batches get bigger, so for bursts of traffic arrival, you start ending up with very large periods of time. Really simply, if you put some structure in between that you can gather up the work, and then something on the other side of it is dragging all that work down and putting it into the store as a single uncontended operation, you'll get much better utilization, much greater throughput, and also much better latency. I keep hearing over and over again that it's a trade-off between latency and throughput. Bullshit. Really, it is bullshit. And we've been believing this in our industry for far too long. 
Anybody wants to come and chat to me about this, I can work you through the math, I can work you through examples. It is so simple. If you batch correctly, and batch is a real-time thing, not an offline slow boat process, you can put it into designs. And I, I, lo I love just doing this over and over with people and showing them how simple it is to get this stuff right and also how simple it is to reason about the code when you do the right things. And it's just simple patterns like this allows you to do it. If you do this, that blue line is what you end up having rather than the red line. The queuing effect gets greatly improved because you don't end up overutilizing the resource because you amortize the cost, which takes your utilization down. Ultimately, you do saturate. Everything saturates if you throw enough load at it, but you get this really nice constant property to the point of saturation. And even then at the point of saturation, it still goes at the maximum throughput it can and does the best it can for you. And you tend to get a linear progression then rather than this just steep J curve where it all goes horribly wrong. Because that's another thing we want is when our systems hit maximum throughput, we don't want the wheels to fall off. We want them to continue doing the best they can at that case and not fall apart. And designing for this, especially with batching, gets you there. So remember, this batch processing is not just for offline. Branches, branches, branches. Horrible in our code and a real major problem. It can be so simple that we do. Like, whenever we run branches in our code, our CPUs are guessing, they're, they're predicting where you can go on those branches. Most of the time they get it right and they're progressing ahead. They're speculating. They don't actually process instructions and just stop because they're constantly cache missing and they want to keep making progress. But if your branch is particularly unpredictable and also there's only so many branches you can have before it starts burying a cost, you start to slow down from a performance perspective. You also slow down a lot from understanding and reason about your code. I quite often see stuff like this where people will go, okay, I'm dealing with nulls, which you really should not be dealing with in your code. Like, we're, we're, we're past this now. It's 2015. We should not be passing things around as nulls, as some sort of value, unless it's very few reasons for how to do that. Like, empty sets in for everything. But then don't start doing shortcuts like, if it is empty, just be allowed sooner. It just doesn't make any sense. It's, it's evil. It's also not the common case. So you start hurting the common case for what you think is an optimization. Just get rid of it. This sort of code, get rid of it. It makes your methods smaller, makes them cleaner, makes them easier to understand, and a lot less buggy, and they're faster. So it's a kind of common pattern that keeps coming up. And so don't have the principle of surprise. Uh, Surprise happening any other time. It should be least surprise. So like, don't be dealing with the nulls. Always be dealing with null objects, empty sets, all that sort of stuff so you start doing the right thing all the time. I think it was uh, Tony Hoare says, like, the null pointer was his billion dollar mistake. We just shouldn't be doing this sort of stuff. Loops are a fascinating one. I've seen loads and loads of statistics that say that our programs probably spend 80% of their time in loops. So how we write loops really matters. This quote on like how you write, so like if anybody's ever written anything, so you're writing blogs or books or anything, you start realizing that you can go back and you can reread what you've written and you can usually shorten it and make it more concise, make it more precise, and make it easier to read. It's exactly the same with your code. That if I had more time, I'd have written a shorter letter. Usually, if I had more time, I could have written a shorter, more concise, more elegant loop. So go back to your code quite often and do this. Because it really starts to matter. So we have an L0 cache in our processors that can only handle about 1,500 microwatts. If you don't fit inside that, you're constantly evicting things from the cache and pulling stuff in, really slows you down. Even more so, once we have dealt with that, we go through to our loop bounce buffers, 28 microwatts at that stage, only eight branches allowed per loop, and no, no returns and no exceptions coming out of a loop, those will, can't fit into those. You've got to go out to the other sides of things. Like Many people have multiple return points from functions, especially in the middle of a loop. That's bad. It's bad to reason about. It's also bad from a performance perspective. Like Eight or more branches in a loop, it's, that's starting to smell a bit as well. Why are you doing that? Single responsibility principle, keep your loops simple, make them really easy to deal with. You should craft your loops like good pros. In fact, this is what I like to do is constantly go back and reread your code. 
because you keep seeing things. You see bugs, you see ways to improve it, you see ways of making stuff better. We should make that a normal way we work is you'll end up with a code base that's much cleaner, much faster, much easier to work with and a lot less buggy. And so we've got these nice simple things that need to be composable. So we've got to think in the composition and for this size really matters. Cliff made this great quote a while ago. I remember dealing with them around how to write methods to make them particularly fast. And he pointed out that how most compilers work is that inlining is the optimization. Everything else is enabled by inlining. So we take a method, if we inline it into another one, we can in, unroll the loop, we can register cache, we can do write combining, we can do all sorts of really nice funky things. But if we can't inline it, it's opaque. We can't combine the things together. And so by start making things small, making them composable, it works out really well. If we make all of our code nice and small and composable, really simple methods, don't worry about the function calls. Our JVMs will just inline them and the function calls gone. And it's all so much more composable. I had a great tweet uh, probably six, nine months ago where I'd done a training course for some people and I was banging this into them, the make small methods, make them composable. They went through and they'd done a lot of this and made it a lot easier to test. And then this guy responded back, he says, just by doing that, some bits of our code are 40 or 60% faster. And there's a whole lot easier to reason about because we let the compiler really get its hands on it now and make it nice and clean. The compiler can't do much with three and 400 line methods that it can't compose them together because they're opaque because they don't inline. We've got to think about these things. So keep things to single responsibility. Like one statement, one thing, one method, one thing, one class, one thing, one module, one thing. If everything has one purpose, not multiple purposes, then they compose much better. So we think that we can build neat things from small atoms. Data, I kind of push on here. We get obsessed with object orientation, where quite often we don't need objects. This is particularly a bad thing of the Java world. Well, really, we want to have great big tables of data. And if your table of data is customer object with an array of references to customers, you're going to point or chase all of the time. Say I want to go through and I want to read all the dates of birth. I want to go through and I want to scan for who's with a certain surname. You don't want to be doing that with objects. Think about this differently. So imagine if each of those fields were just an array of a given type. Now, if I want to search through, I can just scan down that array. I don't have all the headers for the objects. Those are nicely co-located in memory. If I want to view the whole object, well, I can just go through and take the index inside those arrays. How do I walk down through them? Well, just walk down with the index. That can be done with a flyweight. This all suits much better for the locality. As you walk forward, you get the prefetchers helping you. It's going back to those bets. You've got to think about data. Stop thinking about code. Think about data. And this is one of the ways you'll get much, much more performance. And a lot can be learned here from set theory and functional programming. So if you've done a lot of object orientation, one of the ways you'll make yourself a much better programmer is go learn set theory, go learn functional programming, maybe go learn logic programming, learn other ways of thinking. There's a lot you can take away from it, and there's some great stuff there. So I'm going to finish off here with some performance testing. What, do we, what should we be doing with performance testing? First of all, define your performance goals. You need to have something you're shooting for, and you need to know when you're done, when's good enough. Quite often people say, I want to be faster. It's not helpful. I want to have X throughput per second with a response time of Y or have a certain latency curve. And these sort of things are important. So you establish those goals. From there, you can establish design principles. When we worked on Aeron, one of the things we did is we defined our design principles. This lets you make decisions. So for example, we had no garbage in steady state running. You could not allocate. So, we write all of our code, we write all of our tests, we run a profiler that tells us if we've got any allocation. If we have, we get rid of it. We work on it because the allocation will cause GC, and GC will cause latency spikes, and your response time's gone. So being aware of these things, just how to deal with it. How do we measure response time? The important thing is we have to do it with histograms. If you use means, if you use standard deviation, you're deluding yourself and you're completely wrong. You probably should be in Gill's talk, which is down a little bit, but let's look at some things. So here's a typical histogram of measuring the response time of a system. Mode is kind of interesting, the most common case. It actually tells me something useful. 
Median, eh, less useful. Mean, completely bloody useless. It doesn't tell me anything about the typical response time in the system, and it doesn't tell me anything about all this bad stuff that's out here. Do not use means to describe your systems. You need to characterize your system in a histogram like this, and this is how you'll see your systems performing. Another way you can do it is use quantile distributions or percentile distributions and see how your system's behaving at the 90, the 99, three nines, four nines, five nines. And this is a typical ramp up you'll see from a system in how they behave. This is courtesy of Gil from one of his customers who were measuring their system and thinking, ah, uh, this is what we're getting, but that, that's not natural. When you see steep lines and jaggedy bits like that, that is not natural. It's because of a thing called coordinated emission. I advise you to go, go out and Google for coordinated emission and learn what that means. So, and how do we record this? Use a tool like HDR Histogram. It's out there, it's open source, and it does a great job and very cheap to use. If you're gonna benchmark, we're gonna macro benchmark, it's riddled with problems and pitfalls you can fall into. Don't write your own micro benchmarks unless you know a lot of JVM vendors very well, and even then you're kind of crazy doing that. Go pick up something like Java Micro Benchmarking Harness, really great tool. It's even got nice profiling information that comes with it as well. So write these tests and write them in that. Also track CPU performance counters. So what I mentioned about these big loops and the fact that you're evicting from the L0 cache, how do you know that? Well, the CPU can tell you because it has all statistics. It's got statistics on cache misses, branch misses, bandwidth, all of these sorts of things. And you can find it from the CPU performance counters. MSRs are the things to go look for there. And performance testing it needs to be part of continuous integration. It's something you should be doing all the time and running all the time and failing if you don't meet your targets. It's also really good to trend things as well and trend things on graphs to get you doing the right sort of things. Uh, when we were at LMAX, we had a wall of screens for our continuous integration, and a lot of that was our performance figures, where we were graphing response time, graphing throughput between builds, and like whether we're improving or getting worse, and it's really useful to see that. And so make, make sure that this runs well, but also consider, are your acceptance tests suitable for performance tests? Quite often they can be, and make your life a lot simpler. But this is one really, really important point is, we're typically blind in our live systems. We need to be building telemetry in as first class. We need to be building it in from the ground up into what we're doing. Let me just make that point again. We need to be building this into our live systems and doing it from the ground up. It is not an afterthought. If you want your systems to perform well and not be surprised in production, you've got to have telemetry in it. So how do we do that? Well, we put counters in our code. So things like queue lengths, number of concurrent users, number of exceptions, transactions, all of that sort of stuff. Write them to things like memory map files so you can read them without impacting the system at all, without using any locks. There's some great techniques for doing that. There's even, we've put some of this stuff out as open source and it's really useful. But also capturing histograms, capturing histograms of response times, of service times, of queue lengths. Like if you don't know what is your service time, how do you know to tune it? Is that your problem? Like is it your services are taking too long? Are you having a distribution of time? So when you go back to all that sort of like queuing theory, like is your service deterministic? Is it Markovian? and is it Erlang in behavior? You won't start using these models and predicting it. You need to know the models that are possible and you need to fit, fit the right figures into it. And you need to get the things from reality and we can do that. So very quickly in closing, You've got to think of clean as being uncontaminated. Get the stuff out of your code that isn't adding direct value because your code's a liability. One tip, if you measure one thing on a project and how people work that matters more than anything else, lines of code deleted. That will drive much better behaviors than almost anything else. Get the code base down. Make your code representative. It should be a true portrayal of the business problem. It should also be a true portrayal of how to use the system. If you've got classes called weird things that are not related to anything, you're doing it wrong. I'm a great believer in you shouldn't even be documenting. You shouldn't have comments in your code other than references to papers or algorithms or something useful that you need to do. You're doing your code wrong. You should have nice, simple, clean methods that stand on their own that make sense. And does it pass the out loud test? So quite often we'll write things in code that just makes no sense, that if you said it out loud to someone else, you'd laugh. It would be embarrassing. So think of it. Say these things out loud. Dan North talks about he's got a rubber duck on his desk that he says things out loud to, even if you're not talking to another person. But most importantly, 
measure and don't guess. If you want to have performance, you've got to measure and don't guess. And I'll leave you with a kind of interesting quote from Bill Lear, who invented the Learjet. He said, if it looks good, it will fly good. And I find that is so true of code. You can look at code bases and you'll almost know if they're going to perform or if they're going to be buggy. And there's a kind of love, attention to detail that you can see, whether it's clean and whenever it's not. And this is, I think it's the same thing with aircraft, because exactly the same sort of thinking goes into it. The perfect aircraft is not the one that you can add more things to. It's the one that there's nothing left you can take away. It should be the same with your code base when you get it right. And on that, I'll finish off. I think we might have time for a second or a question or two.